At this time, I will not stop. Brother Peter, would you come and join with us? I want you to give a neighborhood a welcome to Brother Peter Bowes as he comes and shares what God has laid upon his heart and what God is doing in their ministry. And I will be quiet and sit down, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, now, don't get too excited. People must start talking about us. Uh, first of all, I, I, again, I just want to thank you, Pastor, for letting me come and minister. And uh, thank you guys for loving on us. That's a good thing, right? To feel welcome in the church. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, for those who remember us from last year, uh, some of you might remember uh, I'm a pastor, and, but not just in a church. I, I, we're ministering. Beside ministering in churches, we're, we're ministering to the motorcycle world too. And we just, last night, we came back from a rally at Beaver Creek, the south of Newport. Uh, and I want you to know, I mean, God is really moving among the bikers. And there's not no big major revival going on and stuff. But it, it, it has been so fun already that yesterday, my wife and I were just talking about it. One lady who has been so up the eyeballs into the new age and stuff. And she said, coming to us, she said, no, why don't you come here with a big tank of water so we can baptize people? And I thought, people like that come up with stuff like that? So I, you, right now we're just kind of praying to say, okay, God, is that really what you want us to do? Now, there are creeks out there. Maybe we just have to use those instead. But, but God is moving, and, and that is awesome. It's exciting. People are getting saved. Uh, this year... Um, God allowed me to do uh, two memorial services for bikers who had died. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I asked, actually, I got invited by one of the bikers, the MCs. I'm talking about serious bikers, not just some people who ride a motorcycle, okay? Uh, uh, one of the, I asked one of those bikers, when he asked me to come to do the memorial service, he says, what, you know that I'm a preacher, right? You know, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal, right? So what, what do you want me to do? Because I knew the guy who had died was really not a confessing Christian. And so I, I knew, too, when I was going to speak, I will address that part. But uh, th he said, um, Peter, just do what you do best. So I said, okay. <laughs> I will give it a shot. <laughs> Ball barrels. But it's kind of funny that you, you plant seeds, you challenge the people who are there, and even though the bar was open and people were drinking and all that stuff, we find out later that as Joanna and we were walking to the neighborhood, people, you know, people want to talk to us continually. We, we constantly have to find a new route to walk. So we can walk, you know, the, the, the one mile in 10 minutes or something, not one and a half hour. But even in our walks, uh, one time we, we met a biker and uh, we were just kind of talking to each other. And, and his mother and father were there too. And he says, you know, Peter, you, you were doing a, the memorial service and you really put me to thinking. And, and I really came to the conclusion that whatever you were saying was right. I needed to make a choice if I was going to go to heaven or if I was going to go down. So I made a choice to, to, to go with God. He said, as a matter of fact, I was even talking to the brothers about that. I mean, talking about evangelism right there. I was even talking to the brothers out there. And some of them make fun of me because I, I, I made a choice to go after God. But then he said, yeah, but I was talking to him. And I said, listen, guys, you guys make fun of me. But you, 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 knew, you knew exactly what was going on. And you agreed, too. Because when Peter prayed, your heads were bowed, your eyes were closed. And you were praying. And when Peter says, and amen, and everybody says, amen. I'm just saying, God, you are so awesome. It's amazing how God works. And, and so seeds are planted, and God is, God is just doing what God does best. And that's the good part, because when God does it, I cannot get in the way. I'm just resting in the Lord. You know, the word of God is never returning void and will guarantee, establish that what God intended to do from the beginning. I mean, that's what it says in Isaiah. New Testament, he who started a good work and you shall complete it before the end of time, right? You hear an amen? Okay. We will get there.
Last year, since the time I was here, um, we, we ministered, besides in the United States, we ministered in, in Holland, in Germany, in Austria, and believe it or not, in es Israel, in an uh, Arabian church. Uh, we got invited to come and minister there. We had no clue what we were going to do, but we got a call from somebody from Israel. He said, we want you to come. And so we went, and anyway, we ministered, praise God. But we also ministered again to the motorcycle world in Austria, and, and especially in Vienna, Austria. There were about uh, 20 outlaw biker groups there, like Hells Angels, Final Daw, Outsiders. It's when, you, when you're at all educated or kind of informed about all the different biker groups out there. I can honestly tell you this. They might have different names, but they're all outlaws and one percenters. Matter of fact, one percenter stands for the fact that that they are doing everything what the 99% doesn't do. <laughs> and they're proud of it. They wear a little insignia right here in their vest, 1%. So, you know, when you see one of them, it's like, oh, better, you know, there are really no lines for them to follow. They just do whatever, whatever sees fit. But we were ministering in a clubhouse, and, and I, you might remember me telling the story about one outsider's, uh, one, no, um, um, an officer of the outsiders uh, started talking to me and started to challenge me a little bit because we were wearing our Christian fest with our Christian symbolism on our clothes, which is the cross, the Bible, and the praying hand. And while you're in the middle of a smoker room where everybody's having skulls and all the other stuff, so one of the officers kind of surrounded by his buddies, he started challenging me, he said, had, had written, uh, read a book, and he had some different thoughts and philosophies about things, and he still just kind of challenging me, hoping he could talk me down. Now, to be honest with you, I had no clue what he was talking about. I did not read his books, and the, his philosophy and all this stuff was just kind of goes over my head, didn't make any sense. So when he was done talking, expecting for me an answer, and what I did is I just told him who I was, where I came from, where I went through, and what the purpose of my life was. And the, the reason of my being there. He was quiet for a little bit. And then he says, you know, Peter, or Pastor Peter, uh, we, we have a rally coming up before long where 500 of us will get together and we will ride through Austria on behalf of our fallen brothers and sisters. And we want you to come and join us getting invited by outlaws to write with them, raising the Christian flag. What do you think about that? doesn't make any sense, does it? It certainly doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, so I could not do it at that time because I would be back in the United States when that ride would take place. Plus, I did not have a bike. Even that would be no problem because they would let you use one. But uh, I had to tell them, I'm, I'm sorry, I could not make it, but maybe another time. Now, last year, I was back in Austria at a different clubhouse, and uh, I thought, you know, maybe I can find the guy who challenged me, who talked to me, and I remembered his name, Max, because we have been praying for Max since we met him, and I, I'm looking forward to meeting him again. So I, I, was, I was back in another cl clubhouse, and I tried to find Max because I saw some outsiders there, and uh, I, I didn't see him. So... I decided to go sit in the bench next to one of the outsiders, hoping I could start a conversation. So, you know, God gave the opportunity to ask a question. I said, you know, is Max around? And this particular guy says, no, Max is not here. And he started telling me in details where Max was and what Max was doing. And after he was telling me all this stuff, what I really don't, didn't care knowing and stuff I really don't supposed to know, because they're pretty close-lipped anyway. He says, but I know you. And the back of my mind says, uh-oh. He says, yeah, I remember you from last year. You were here, and I heard you were talking to Max, and Ma I heard what you said to Max. And, you know, it really stirred some questions in my mind. And, and nobody could ever answer me those questions. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know what the questions are, but once you give me the question, maybe I can give you an answer on that. 
So he started asking me questions about God's mercy, God's grace, and God's love, God's plan, God's purpose. And I was glad to be able to give him an answer on those things. But then my time was up. It was about midnight, and I needed to go back to the place we were staying. The next morning early, I had to go preach again, so I needed to clean up and have some rest. So I said, you know, I need to go right now. But, you know, it's nice meeting you. I hope they'll see you again the next time. And he stood up, too. Then he pulled his wallet out of his pocket, then out of his wallet, the business card. And he says, Peter, the next time you come to Austria, you come to Vienna, I want you to come and visit our clubhouse, too. I don't know if that rings a bell in your mind. When outlaws invite you to come and to bring the presence of Jesus into a room like that, that can only be God. So God is working. And, and what I want to say with this, when you have been praying for us in this last year, I have thought about us. Uh, we want to thank you for standing with us. Thank you for your prayers. Because we also realize that it's not a one man's job. It's, it's something we ought to do together. We're in it together. We are one army, right? So thank you. Thank you for standing with us. And, and praise God for the things he's doing. And uh, to him all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Amen? Now, relating all the stories, what I've shared with you, there is another thing, what, uh, what came out of it, something that makes me think. Even yesterday we met a, an older gentleman, I think he's somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, I don't know. He's a biker. And he started telling me his background. He started telling me how he was raised in a Baptist church, and then later he went to a Nazarene church, and then... I mean, he was going to just trying to different churches, and, and he was just kind of, he, he felt beaten up in the church because there's so much chaos going on. There's so many arguments, so much divisiveness. So he decided not to go to church anymore. Now, the big question, what came up, where is, where is God in all of this? And I think that's a good question because we can all kind of go through things, don't we? We, we go through valleys, and yes, we have mountaintops, but then we go back to another valley, right? But did you know, by the way, there's not going to be any mountaintop when there is no valley? Learning process. The reality is we all go through valleys, hardships. We have losses. We have disappointments. We have frustrations, irritations, loss. Come on, help me out. There are other things in the valley what discourage us, what draws our attention away from God. And yes, praise God, because of his greatness and his faithfulness, he is helping us to get through those things and go back on the mountaintop. But the reality is, in the process of all that changes, we often fail to see God in the whole thing. Where is God in all of this? This morning, what I want to do is I want to encourage you and help you to overcome the question. As I uh, start preparing for this message, God led me to a scripture out of Psalm chapter 19. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation for the simple reason uh, that language is pretty easy to talk about and to understand. In Psalm 19, it's from the choir director in Psalm of David. He says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Yet, their voices and their voices is never heard. Yet, their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. 
The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The degrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The law of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripped from the womb, from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Going back to the question, where is God in all of this? You know, I believe God understands those frustrations. He understands those moments that were kind of lost in our circumstances. But God is trying to say this. He says, you know, even in the midst of all of this, in the midst of your storm, in the midst of all the waves which have taken place, he is there. Here, looking at the Psalms, he says this. He says, he says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. And night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word yet. And their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words through all the world. In the midst of problems, in the middle of the issues, God is still there and he's still speaking. I remember at one time I was asked to do a series of services in Alaska, especially in the southeast. You have those islands out there, you know, Juno, you have Wrangell, Ketsikan, Petersburg. Uh, um, anyway, just to mention a few. And, and God wanted me to do revival services in those places, we, like this one-week services. Of course, those things excite me because I love to talk about revival. I love to try to bring and encourage people to be revived in Jesus. But this is the first church I was going to go into was in Wrangell, Alaska. And when I came there, I found out in that island of Rang that by where Wrangell is at, uh, the, the island has less than 1,000 people on it, and everybody knows each other, and somehow everybody's related to each other. But when I came there, I, I learned that in the, last, in the last three months, they had nine deaths. Some people had died from old age. Some people had died from diseases. Some people had died because of murder. Some people had died because of suicide. When I came there, it was pretty messy. The, the spirit in the hearts and the mind of the people was kind of like, who is going to be number 10, 11, and 12? And then I had to start doing revival services. <laughs> Let me tell you, it was quite a challenge to, to help them to overcome their their, their sorrows, their fears, their doubts, and their loss, and their, their hurt. But praise God, God was bigger than that. Isn't it great that no matter where we are, no problem is really bigger than God. God is always bigger than it, right? So after a week of services, God really came through in that place, and the joy of the Lord renewed them and, and really touched their lives. But I remember that the next day when I was getting into the airplane to go to the next island, I remember sitting in a plane feeling empty. I mean, I was empty. I was tired. I was exhausted. And I find myself sitting in the plane, staring out the window, seeing only the, the gray clouds. I, I find my, myself thinking, you know, what in the world am I doing here? I am empty. I have nothing else to give. Let me tell you, it's one of the most horrible feelings I ever had. Is to be poured out and being totally empty. God, I have nothing else to give. What am I going to tell the next people? I don't have no, I have no ex excitement, no more enthusiasm. I am, I am. Oh, you guys would say blah. 
So I was just sitting there staring at the, out the window, looking at the graves, and I was just saying, God, you need to help me. You need to do something. You need to give me a new revelation. You need to give me something. You need me to give me the, the hard pedals or something so I can go to the next church and be a blessing to them too. And as I was praying, looking outside the window, suddenly the clouds open up. And I saw the trees and I saw, I saw the, the houses, I saw the mountains, I saw the beauty of Alaska. And as I was just kind of at awe about what I saw, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And he says, Peter, enjoy this. For when you enjoy this, you enjoy me. And I said, thank you, Lord. Wow. Let's, let's practice this English word. Say, wow. I mean, really, that is something what happens. Sometimes we get our eyes so much on the despair, on the problems, on the discouragement. In the back of our mind, we have an idea how things ought to be and they're not. And we're confused in the midst of it. And then they ask the question, where's God in all of this? In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from the New International Version, the first three verses, Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the, po the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the, so, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Where's God? Fix your eyes on Jesus. You feel that God is so far away? Hey, let's open the curtains. Look at what God has done. Look what God has made. And even though you might not God hear, you might not hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you directly about some big major things. Just look at him and let nature, what he created, speak to you. And remind you that he is there. He's there. Well, my wife and I, when we were going to the clubhouses and those places where <laughs> bad people are hanging out, Jesus is there. This is awesome. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? So sometimes, believe it or not, we, we can get so sidetracked in legalism and tradition, in law, that we are forgetting that God is bigger than that. We love to bring the presence of Jesus into the dark places. For how deeper the darkness, the brighter the light. God is there. So we need to learn to fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's talk about some aspects about that. The first thing I think we need to remember that, that uh, Jesus is the Son of God. We need to remember there is no other name given under heaven to be saved in the name of Jesus. He is and was and is to come. He is on the throne. In the midst of our issues, in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our challenges, He is still sitting on the throne. Get excited about that? You want to do the happy dance? You know, when my wife and I, we, we meet guys and girls, I mean, both sides of the fence, we're, we're meeting people and who are so overwhelmed by so much hurt and so much pain. And yes, many of it has, has been created because of their own sin. We need to remind them and we do remind them that God is still there. Remember the person of Jesus. 
Secondly, I think we need to keep in mind as we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, his presence. He says, lo, I'm with you always. When my wife and I were going into clubhouses or rallies, we're not going there alone. He's with us. He says he will never leave us nor forsake us. You ever felt lonely? Come on, let's be honest with you. This is Pentecostal church. You can raise your hands. You ever felt lonely? You know, that loneliness is again, it's an evidence that, that we feel like there's nobody caring. Nobody is there. Nobody to support us. Nobody loving us. Nobody understanding us, right? Well, the reality is, in the midst of that point, that feeling of loneliness, Jesus is still there. And the only thing we just have to do is start praising him. And the moment you start praising him, we will, he, he will, he's going to charge your batteries. Something's happening. You know, when you give God your best, he's going to give you his best. And his best outdoes your, out, your best anytime. So remember his presence. He says, I'm with you always. Then thirdly, as we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, we need to remember the power. The power. Acts 1 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be my witness. I love what, it's, what Paul reminds the church of Ephesians about. He says, The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is yours. We don't have to assume the spirit or the attitude of defeat. Because sometimes we do that, don't we? When things get tough and the tough gets going, what do we do? We throw our hands in the air and say, okay, no hope. Those problems are bigger than my whatever. The reality is God has given us the power to overcome. In the midst of our challenges, God has given us the power to overcome. You know, I was telling you the story about this outsider. Outsiders, by the way, are, are really kind of the same level as hell's angels. Just kind of give you a little idea how serious it is. And then you get challenged in those clubhouses because of your Christianity. And when you're surrounded with about 100 of those wild guys, it, it can be kind of intimidating, right? No? You guys want to go with us? <laughs> you know, the one of the things what we're being reminded about, that God is there. He has, he has not sent me into that place by myself. And one of the challenges that are coming, let me tell you something. He has given me the power. He who is with me is greater than who is with them. Don't you believe that? God has given us power. You know, one of the things that sometimes drives me nuts is the fact that why, why, why are we Christians behaving like a bundle of wimps? Of course, I'm talking about the other church, the other planets, okay, please? <laughs> Man, I'm getting someone in trouble. I'm assuming this is going to be the last time Pastor Gary allows me to preach in his church. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, really, I mean, sometimes, even though we're, we're a member of CMA, we're working with other CMAers, Christian motorcycles, you know, uh, bikers. And, and they just want to play it all safe. God never played it. This doesn't, didn't call us to play it safe. He's telling us to go into the world to make disciples, not suggest disciples. And when God put out his spirit upon our flesh, he, he, he did not just, he, he did not say in Acts 1 8, you, you shall your power and the Holy Spirit come upon you and you shall be shallow. No, you shall be my witness. And let me tell you, there's not a whole lot of leeway in that, is it? Is it? So we remember, as we're going through things and we're being challenged by our environments, we, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. He is there. He, he's God. He's sitting on the throne. 
He's there with me. And then his power that I can plug into to overcome whatever challenge there may be. And then we need to fix our eyes on Jesus in the form of promise. You know, God has given us promises. He says, along with you always. It's a promise. He is there. Yeah, we can feel in the dark sometimes, right? Not you guys. You guys are always in the light, right? <laughs> but his promise, he is he's there. And he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. He is not going to set us up to become failures. He is not going to... He's not going to raise us up so we can fall down. In the world, it is this way that sometimes you feel that people are lifting you up and when things go well and then something else goes better, is coming up and they're dropping you and then boom, right? Let me tell you something. My God, my Jesus does not do that. He will carry me through. I mean, I like the, the story about the, the feet prints in the sand. Do you remember that? It's his promise. He will carry us through. His promise that when we're going through valleys, we can go to him. Anybody has a need, go to him. Anybody lacking wisdom, go to him. And he is willing and ready to give us whatever tool we need. You're burdened. Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, you weird and burdened. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble of heart, and you find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is. What? That's his promise. When we're going through things, we just have to hang on and hold on the promise of God. Fix your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on the promise. Fix your eyes in Jesus. Where's God in all of this? Oh boy, He's there. He's there. I, I like what Pastor Gary said this morning. You know, there to smile. You know, sometimes we're communicating in the presence of God to each other by just smiling at each other. Just an embrace. High five, kind word. Kind of amazing how we can bring the presence of Jesus into a dark situation, isn't it? And sometimes that's exactly what people need. They can be so much in the, into the valley that, they're, that, that they, feel, they feel that nothing cares. Everything is dark. And then somebody else comes by and says, hi, how are you doing? Mentioning you by your name. Smile. Wow. Kind of makes you feel good, doesn't it? Not in this church. The other churches, they do, though. <laughs> Come on, I need to mess with you guys a little bit. You know what they say about people like me? We blow in, we blow up, and we blow out. So I need to do some blowing, right? <laughs> yeah, and I already blew it anyway. <laughs> Pastor Kerry was going to throw me out, but. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look, look at this compassion. You know, having been in Israel, and, and I want you to know, it, it has been quite an amazing experience for us. Um, we got invited by a pastor we knew for years. He used to be the pastor at the oldest Assemblies of God church, a Pentecostal church in Europe. And he is also Jewish, and he retired in Amsterdam, so he he ended up doing a lot of ministry in Israel. And he called us up. He said, Peter, we want you to come. And we said, you know, I know we're going to be in Europe in that particular time. We don't, we don't know if we can do it. I mean, it costs a lot of money. So we need to pray. Pray that God is going to help us out and do that, all that. And, uh, you know, we, we just need to pray about that. So we did. We prayed. And God says yes. And God provided. Actually flying from Amsterdam to, to Tel Aviv is really not that expensive compared to flying from here to down there. And uh, anyway, I w we came and we came into Tel Aviv, and then we drove, took a tr train ride to where we gonna, we're going to be picked up by him in a car. So we took that ride, and we got 
to met to meet him with the car and we were not in in his presence we just said hi bye how, hi how you doing and all the good stuff and then he says by the way you know you're going to be preaching out here don't you i said oh good i'm so glad you're telling me that <laughs> so I, yeah i preached in a in a arabian church well, it was really amazing you know in in in, in israel um the people from Arabia, from that kind of world, they have church every night. And I wish I could say that too, praise the Lord, because there's something I need to say too. Every night, there's a different family worshiping God. They cannot worship God together because of tribal issues. It's almost kind of like the American denominations, isn't it? We have to go to a domination where people like me and love me and believe what I believe and say what I li or like to say, and, right? But really, there was, there's a lot of spiritual confusion going on. And yes, in the midst of all the spiritual evidences of God's, of the biblical truth, there are still a lot of people who don't see God. I mean, that's where the question again comes up. Where's God in all of this? But having been there, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the scripture out of Matthew chapter 9. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, then Jesus went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But then when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because of them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And then, as, then he said to the disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. You know, in the midst of it all, God has compassion. God is not harsh. God is not hard. We're living in a time of grace. It's not a grace that says that we can do anything we want to do, but it doesn't matter. It does matter. God is calling us to walk the straight and narrow. He's calling us to be obedient, okay? But also, he's calling us to call sin, sin. But even though in the midst of it, all, even though we're falling and messing up, and we can mess up big time, God is still looking at us with eyes and a heart compassion you know I'm just thinking about some bikers road brothers her name is Darcy his name is uh, Keith his uh, biker name is crazy serious bikers that's kind of amazing I had a chance to just talk to them and talking with her and telling her that in the midst of all of that, all the stuff she's involved in, all the stuff she's done, God loves her. God has not given up on her. And God's grace is sufficient for her. I mean, just sharing that in the midst of all that feeling of hopelessness, showing her that God was still there. And sh God still cared. It caused streams, tears running down her face. <laughs> As she has to turn around quick because she wanted to be tough in the midst of it all. But you know, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on his compassion. When you look in the mirror and you like to beat yourself on the head because of the goose-ups you've made. Or, or when you're looking at somebody else who's on the street, it, it, some of them, yeah, one percenters, outlaws. You know, God is still looking at them with compassion. As a sheep without a shepherd. Do you know that God called each one of us to be shepherds? We just have to learn to look at the people around us with compassion and you will become one because you would want to extend yourself to others 
the way Jesus extends himself to you. It's kind of what the Bible says. It's the love of God that compels us to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us. See, fixing your eyes on Jesus is not just something that is beneficial for you, but ultimately your focus on Jesus will be beneficial of those around you. It will change your environment. It, it will change your family, your family relationships. You know, sometimes we can be harsh, especially harsh at home, right? Because things don't quite go the way you want it. Our husband doesn't quite do what they're supposed to do. And our wife is disappointing. And our children are messing up. And, uh, you know, we kind of lose control, raising our voice, get angry. No, not, not here because you, you <laughs> some people do anyway. But the reality is when you're looking at the eyes of Jesus, it's not that we're going to justify all the wrong that's been taking place. But we will deal with it in a totally different spirit. And I believe that, that one of the reasons we have been fruitful is not because we went in there judgmental. <laughs> we just started loving Donna. Our ministry, we're going to love people. And yes, we understand it's hard to soar with eagles when you live with turkeys. But just feed them anyway. Right? Fix your eyes on Jesus. His compassion, his love, his mercy, and his grace. You know, I can understand, having come to the end of this message, I can understand that, like me on that airplane, that there may be people here who say, you know, I feel kind of empty. I feel kind of blah. I feel like I, I, I've given everything I've given, and, and I'm just empty. I, I'm stuck. I can understand as I start praying for a new revival of a new revelation of him, that you might too need a new revelation of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be praying about. I'm going to ask the piano player to come. And I want to ask everybody else to stand up, please. Let me ask you a question as you stand up. How, how many of you heard the Holy Spirit talk to you this morning? Praise the Lord. Joanne, I want you to come and join me, please. That's my beloved. You know, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, please do not look at your husband, your wife, or your children. Do not give in to fear. Do not give in to the intimidation. Do not give in to pride. No, don't give in to all those wrong feelings. When you heard the Holy Spirit talk to you, and you recognize the fact that you need a new revelation of Jesus, so that you can approach your life different, so that you feel that your batteries are charged again, don't you feel you have new hope, new vision, new love? Now I'm going to count to three, and I want you to come because we want to pray with you. That God is going to grant you a new revelation so you will recognize His presence in whatever circumstances you're in. Is that what you want? Is that what you like? One, two, three, the others are open. Come. Let us pray for you. Come on. Come on, people. I know I saw you guys raising your hands. You need a revelation of Jesus. Then come. Don't rob yourself from God's blessing, okay? You have a hard time looking at the world around you with compassion. I mean, especially with all the political garbage what's going on. I mean, it's kind of hard to have compassion, isn't it? be honest with you, I can look at the TV and I listen to the radio and I listen to all the junk that's out there. I can get angry. 
know, I would like to bless all those politicians with the point of my shoe. How, how many feel that way? You know, it's hard to look at, through the eyes of Jesus at those people, isn't it? And I pray then, God, help me to love those people. Help me, Lord, to remind me to pray for those people. Come on, are you there? Come, let us pray for you, okay? Pastor, you can come and join us too if you want to.
ushers to get a ready to we're going to receive an offering to take up. You may be seated. You may be seated and we're going to take up an offering. Here's our ushers. We're going to get ready here in just a moment. We're going to ask them to come forward. We're going to wait till they're finished praying and then we're going to receive them. Ushers, come forward, please. I want to thank you for your reverence and your respect during the time that Brother Peter was praying. Last year, when Brother Peter was here, we received an offering. Apparently, we didn't get enough money to get him far enough out of the country, and he came back. So this time, we want to get him further out of the country. <laughs> oh, praise God. Father, we come before you. We have a privilege. We have an opportunity, even though we ourselves individually, maybe we cannot join with Brother Peter to go into the areas that he's going Lord, we may not be able to go to Austria. We may not be able to go to England and to the places that you're sending and you're providing and opening doors for him to go. But we can go by supporting him. We can go by giving into an offering. We can go, Father God, by being part of him and praying with him, loving on him and supporting him and his precious wife. Lord, we can be there in prayer. We can be there uplifting and upholding him. And we can be there in our giving and our gifts. So as we take up the offering this morning, may we get outside of ourselves. And Father, your word said in Peter, or in Paul says in Philippians that Jesus did not consider himself to be better than anybody else, but he considered others. And Lord, that is our part, is to consider others more than ourselves at times. And at this point, Lord, we would consider helping others that are in darkness, that we would send someone, Lord God, that can go into those dark areas and shine the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We could die to self by taking what we would want to hold out for ourselves and give to you through this opportunity. So, Father, as we take this offering, we pray that it would be given for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ to send our brother into the darkness that he might shine the light. We ask in your name. Amen. one more time we thank you so much for coming and being with us we thank you 
that uh, you stayed so faithful and reverence and respectful. Uh, Brother Peter and Sister Joanne was praying. We would like to ask you to be encouraged to get around, to get to know them, talk to them, share with them. Let them know that you're glad they came to be with us here at Neighborhood Assembly of God. Don't be in a hurry to rush off. Fellowship one another, shake hands, hug one another's neck, guys with guys, women with women. Let them know how precious and important they are. Amen? You're dismissed. Go with the Lord. We hope to see you next week, especially since then afterwards, we're going to go out to Fern Ditch and have a barbecue. <laughs>